the cusp of a fundamental disruption to how we produce food. You know, by 2030, the cost of production of protein is going to come down by five times, and by 2035, by 10 times. And that's, that's compared to animal protein, so that's going to have huge ramifications for how we produce protein. In 2019, Catherine Tubb and her think tank sent shockwaves through the meat industry. In her report, she made an apocalyptic prognosis. Hi. Hi. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. How can I help? I was looking for a piece of steak for a special occasion. Okay. I don't know if you can recommend anything. Yeah, I've got some T-bones here, uh, ribeyes. But if I was to go for anything today, I would probably have a nice bit of this sirloin. Yeah, absolutely yeah. delicious. The most radical change is because the cost of protein is going to come down by five to ten times, there's going to be a huge impact in the number of animals. So we actually forecast 50% fewer cows by 2030 and 75% fewer cows by 2035. We really do expect the cow will be obsolete by 2035. So having written this report, it just gave me a really great vision of the future, a really optimistic view that all the possibilities that come from this new technology and from any new technology. And I think that was like the real aha moment, I guess, for me, um, was about just the vision of the future that I can see around food and all the other changes that are going to come from technology. How do they look? They look brilliant, thank you. Lovely. Excellent. Like any disruption, there's going to be lots of winners and lots of losers. It's hard not to see kind of people really embedded in traditional agriculture being the losers um, in, in that more industrial state. If we imagine that her predictions come true and vegetables and meat will soon be produced in factories, does that mean farmers are doomed to disappear? Je ne sais pas trop comment répondre à cette question. C'est délicat. Je ne sais pas. Moi, je suis très optimiste sur mon métier. Je suis sûre qu'il y aura encore des paysans demain. C'est indispensable. Tout arrêter comme ça, ne plus avoir de, 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 de contact avec cette nature, non, tout. Enfin, non, non je ne vois pas. Ou alors, ça veut dire qu'il n'y aura plus, plus d'humains. Il n'y a plus de paysans, il n'y a plus d'humains. Perhaps the future is here, in Burren Park, in Northwest Ireland. Brendan Dunford has tried a new way of supporting traditional agriculture while preserving nature. The work here began around, I guess, 20 years ago. Um, and we did some research um, all about the relationship between farmers in the burn and their landscape. Uh, and we found out that, OK, the wrong type of farming, uh, very intensive modern methods, can be very damaging to this environment. But in contrast, uh, traditional farm practices, old grazing regimes and uh, management regimes, are really critical to maintaining the biodiversity and the natural environment in the barn. So when we finished that research, um, there was a recognition, not just within the farming community, but within the conservation authorities, that we need farmers on the land farming in a way that they have done for 6,000 years if we want to protect the burn into the future. So the challenge then became, how do we support these farmers? Brendan's programme provides grants to farmers who limit their environmental impact. Rewards of sorts, funded by the EU and the Irish government. So in the burn programme, we have um, a way of rewarding farmers who deliver great outcomes for our environment. So we have a very simple scorecard where we walk each field, like this field, every summer and using 10 different categories, the grazing level, the condition of the natural water sources, the feeding system, the presence of invasive species, is there any damage being done? And we tallied all those up to create a score of 10. This simple yet attractive programme has already won over 300 farmers who maintain 23,000 hectares of land. Michael Devoren is one of them. That's the kind of the farm, the farm planting, all yeah, the fields okay. on it. And then um, this then will be the, the field scores. As a recommendation about how you improve the score, then the area of the field, the score to 10, if it's gone up or down, 
and the amount of money that this, each field um, earns for the farmer in terms of the environment. Yeah, why am I only in an island in that piece? Well, I thought Just that this not is not doing hard enough. You listening? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. no answer. You Just work hard. Just, Look, that's a department. You're going, up, you're, you're going up there, and you're going up there, yeah. so you know, and you're going up there as well, in fairness, yeah. and there, so all good. There's nothing to make society wherever you live like money. That's what makes the world go round, and like. Managing the farm, doing this environmental farming, as it's called, earns us good money. Maybe up to a third of our income comes from, from there at the minute. And the better the score, the more money I earn. So yes, but it isn't really competition with my neighbour. I'm wondering, what's he doing that I'm not doing? And I want to do that because it gets, earns me more money. So that's the real reason that I'm doing it. I'm a businessman and I have to earn a living, first and foremost. What the farmer has done here over the last number of years is first of all he's repaired the walls and that's allowed him to target grazing more effectively here and by targeting grazing in wintertime you're creating more flowers in summertime. Secondly, the water source which was previously polluted by cattle standing in it, he's built a wall around it and pumped the water to a storage trough uh, which then feeds troughs for the cattle so that allows the animals to drink clean fresh water but also keeps the water source fresh and clean for us who are drinking also the water around this area. The third thing he's done is he's changed his feeding system. He's moved towards a more bespoke feeding system, which actually does less damage to the environment and encourages greater grazing levels. And over the years, by virtue of those management interventions and better grazing, so putting more cattle on here at the right time, the score has gone from a six to a seven to an eight to a nine, and now it's a 10 out of 10. Because my God, when you look around here, you can see that this is pretty much perfect. The land is being managed beautifully. So the farmer is getting a premium payment. It's a win-win situation for farmers and nature. Grasslands have recovered, along with biodiversity. I think there's, there's huge challenges, and we need, we need huge changes, and we need them really quick. And that's why I'm excited about the potential of the farmers and the fishers and the foresters of the world, the kind of the unsung heroes. If we can get those on board, um, working towards a certain outcome, if we can get those, those communities to buy in um, and to be the leaders, to be the, the catalysts for change, to be the first responders to these crises, I, I, th I think I th I'm optimistic that can happen. Europe spends billions of euros for farmers to produce more and cheaper. At the same time, soils are dying, species are disappearing, and our health is deteriorating. Can we expect laboratory farming to make mass production more sustainable? And will farmers manage to once again become real players in biodiversity and the guardians of our countryside?